Howdy. You know, I began the year, or ended last year, by saying I was going to be a bit more authentic and tell a few more truths, and some of them were not going to necessarily be nice. And today is one of those videos. I hope it doesn't take overly long, but this is something that needs to be said. I have mentioned often that I am a consultant. I'm a consultant in healthcare and leadership. I'm independent, work for myself, I'm incorporated. T.T. Mitchell Consulting Incorporated. I've been doing this now, what, since 2001, so this will be my 17th year come June. And you would think that working for yourself, it's tough, but that if you proved yourself in certain ways that things would go easier for you. And I'm going to let you know the truth. It's not easy at all. <laughs> it's not easy, uh, easy in healthcare. It's not easy in leadership. It's not easy in blogging. It's not easy in social media. Let's start with social media and blogging before I get to the other stuff. You know, I am one of those people who wonders how come there's these top 50 lists of bloggers or top 50 people in social media or top 50 people in online marketing, content creation, and whatever, and you almost never find a black person on it. You might find one, and it's no one that I know. And trust me, I know a lot of the black people who are online creating content and doing social media. I know this because I write about them on my blog, and I put their names out there, and I highlight, and I've talked to most of these people. So if I know who they are, how come no one else knows who they are? But we don't show up on any list. Now, they may call it the top. What they basically mean are their favorite. That's a different story. Because people tend to gravitate towards people who are just like them. I, I've had this discussion and battle with people for six or seven years now. Where I've asked people, how come there's no black people on your list? Oh, I don't know any. We're out here. I've been blogging, what, 12 years now. I've got 5,000 articles online. How come you don't know who I am? Content creation, I've been creating content for decades now. So, <laughs> you know, but this is just me. There's other people doing the same type of thing. We never get an acknowledgement. So I put that out there to say that online is difficult enough. Sure, I know a lot of people at this point online or people know who I am, but I never end up in any lists of anything special. Eh, it is what it is. However... Blogging and social media are not what I make my money off of. I make most of my money off of healthcare consulting. I make some off of the leadership, but I make most of my money off of healthcare consulting. And this is what I'm basically going to tell this story about what it's like trying to be a black consultant in an industry where the overwhelming majority of consultants are white and the overwhelming number of people who are hiring are white. And if you don't believe this story, trust me, it happened. It happens often. But I'm going to use this example. And in being authentic, I'm going to name organizations. I'm not going to name any names of people except to talk about something nice later on, but I'm going to name organizations. So, I was a part of this organization called HFMA, Healthcare Finance Management Association. I was a member of that group for almost, what, at least 12, 13 years. Local group. Never went to any of the national stuff. I did go to a couple of conferences that were held out at Turning Stone, which is about 45 minutes away. But in general, I was a member of the local group. I was a member of the local group because I was president of another local group that's affiliated with the national group. Uh, Mid-York Medical Management Association. The national group was called AHAM. So... Anyway, I was with these groups for years, then I became independent, still a member of the groups, still doing all this kind of stuff, and HFMA one time decided it was going to hold a social event at a place here in Syracuse called Coleman's. We call it in Tipperary Hill, whatever, but it's, you know, it's a unique area in the fact that the stoplights are upside down, so green is on top <laughs> and red is on the bottom. The city has tried to change it. They tried it for a couple of decades. The residents kept changing it. They've left it alone. So it's the only place like that in the area. So they decided to hold it at Coleman's. 
I figured, you know what, this gives me an opportunity to maybe talk to a few more of the people in the organization. These people had seen me, by the way. Like I said, I was a paid member of the local chapter for a long time. So I go to Coleman's for this networking event. And I walk up to the second level, which is where they're staging it, which is actually interesting because I never knew that Coleman's had a second level until this event. And I get up there and you hear the conversation and conversation stops. This happens often when I walk into a group that's not expecting someone like me. But these are some of these people who knew who I was, or at least should have known who I was. I've been going to meetings. Like I said, I've been president of this or other organization for 15 years. We've done joint events. All conversation stops. There's one guy who welcomes me. This guy named Tom. He welcomes me because I'd known him by that time almost 20 years uh, <laughs> through a different association, but I'd known him. So he, I get to go talk to. But he was with some other people. Not a single one said a word. Now, maybe I'm more in tune with my feelings than everyone else, but I got the vibe that no one wanted to talk to me, that they didn't know how to talk to me. They were going to act like they didn't know who I was. This is common, by the way. I'm hard to miss. You know, <laughs> Syracuse, New York is not replete with black professionals in healthcare. It's just not. Matter of fact, the country isn't replete with black professionals in healthcare. So there's no way these folks didn't know who I was. But still, none of them would talk to me. And by the end of the night, besides Tom, only two other people talked to me the entire night. One of them was Mexican and one of them was Asian. And we sat by ourselves. No one came over to say hi. No one came over to try to say any kind of greeting whatsoever. It just didn't happen. <sighs> this is what happens. And like I said, this was not something where I had not met any of these people before. They just didn't want to talk to me in a social setting. Why? I don't want to necessarily use the R, R word. I don't want to say that. I'd love to say it, but I don't want to say that. What I will say is that many years later, there was a position at St. Joseph's Hospital right here in Syracuse. And I decided to apply for the position. Even though I loved consulting, my thought was um, if I got this position, it was going to pay really well. I could be here in town. I would have health insurance that I didn't have to pay for. And it just sounded like, you know what, this would be great. I don't have to now do any more uh, you know, publicity, marketing, none of that, whatever. So I go in for the first interview. They set the date. As a matter of fact, I sent the resume out the next day when they got it. They called me up to set up the interview for that Friday. I show up for the interview. I had to sit out there 20 minutes, even though they set the time. I go in for the interview, and there's the person in HR, and she says to me, and I'm wearing this suit all nice and everything, so you're here for the housekeeping position, right? I'm thinking... You're looking at the resume. You see it right there. Look how I'm dressed. I'm not here for housekeeping. So I say that to her. No, I'm here for blank. It's right there. Oh, geez, I'm sorry. She wasn't sorry. Maybe she felt embarrassed, but she didn't do her job right. So anyway, I talked to her for about 30 minutes. Fine. Now, the person who's going to be over the department I report to is across town. So now I got to go across town. So I get there, I park the car, I go in the building, and there is a receptionist there. So I go over, I see her doing some things, so I just stop. I'm there 10 minutes. Trust me, I'm 10 minutes because I'm getting hurt. I'm six foot tall. I used to be six foot half an inch, but I've shrunk. I'm six foot tall. I'm a big guy. I'm hard to miss. I'm wearing a suit. I'm clean. And it took her 10 minutes before she looks up and says, oh, I didn't see you standing there. Really? The sunlight was coming in. It was casting a shadow on you. you. She did everything she could not to look straight ahead. I'm right there in front of her. I saw her do this. 
How do you miss me? You can't miss me unless you're doing it intentionally. So I tell her why I'm there. Of course, now it looks like I'm late, like I got lost for the interview. So this woman comes down eventually. I know who she is. I know her name. She was one of those people who I knew from this organization, HFMA, I told you about. So I said, hi, mention her name. Do we know each other? Yes. We were both members of HFMA a long time ago. We've been in a few meetings together. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't remember you. I'm the only black person in the room. How do you not remember me? <laughs> okay, fine. You don't remember my name. How do you forget me? Trust me. You, you can't. We go upstairs to the interview. This is for a high-powered position. I'm serious. I'd have been paid good money for this position. I had the experience for it. At that time, what did I have? I had almost 30 years experience doing this specific thing that they needed at that time. Her first question to me was, why would you want this position? And this was not one of those exploratory things. This is the very first question. And her thought was, well, I've been traveling around doing independent consulting. Maybe this, I would think this would not offer enough challenge. So I tell her, I'm looking for something that could be stable. I'm right here in town. This would be great insurance. I could do this job. I'm very good at what I do. I've done all this stuff. It was all on my resume, the accomplishments I've had. Interview lasted five minutes. I'm not sure it lasted a full five minutes because I obviously couldn't look at my watch at the time. And then that was it. She said, well, you know, we have a lot of qualified candidates, a lot of experience. I said, mm-hmm, okay, yeah. And I knew they didn't. <laughs> this is a closed field of sorts. I think I have met maybe three or four people nationwide, mind you, who do what I do as a consultant. Large hospitals will sometimes have someone like this, but not all that often. So I knew. And by Monday, I already had the rejection. <laughs> there was no consideration. There was nothing. This is what it's like being a black consultant in a white-dominated field. This is just one story. I have other stories. But I started, thought I would start with this one. I'm going to do the next one on my business channel. And I'm probably going to dress a little differently so I look a little bit more professional on there. And I will probably link to this one at some point. But this is what it's like. It ain't easy. And because of that, there's people I need to thank. I need to thank a guy named Jim Yarzinski. And I need to thank a guy named Keith Seidel. Because these guys have been solid for me over the years as a consultant. They have been solid. Didn't matter what I was. It mattered that they thought I could do the work and I did the work for them. And loyalty is number one on my list of morals and whatever. And these two guys have been it. So thank you. I hope you guys see this, or at least hear a little bit about it. But this is what it's like. Part two, like I said, is going to be on my other channel. I'll probably link to it. So then I can link this one to that one. This is what it's like being authentic. Y'all take care.